I think let's get started. Um, anyway, we are going to do the introduction in the first couple of minutes. So uh, hopefully people won't miss anything if they join a couple of points late. All right, let's get started then. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, where Sanchez and I are going to talk about um, how at Pinterest we improve the interactive growing experience with Spark SQL. Uh, but uh, I think the most important thing first, uh, which is about uh, us, um, uh, I am Ashish Singh. I'm the tech lead uh, on Big Data Query Platform at Pinterest, uh, and um, uh, where I primarily work on uh, things related to how to improve uh, query experience, how to make it more efficient. And as such, we also work on like what, uh, how the data should be stored, what format it should be in, how to organize the metadata. Um, yeah, and then goal is uh, make compute uh, or querying uh, and efficient um, and uh, also make it easier for the users, um, which is where the querying experience uh, comes in. Um, cool. Sanchez, do you want to introduce yourself here? Hey everybody, uh, my name is Sanchez, and I'm a software engineer on the Big Data Query Platform team at Pinterest. And I primarily focus on making the in-house interactive SQL query pipelines more efficient, reliable, and feature-rich. Thanks, Sanchez. Short of the street. All right, uh, so this is the agenda for today's session. Uh, we are going to go over the background uh, and then we'll discuss the uh, high level architecture of the, uh, to do the interactive querying with Fox SQL uh, at Pinterest, uh, which hopefully should open up uh, questions uh, on what were the various approaches that we considered, why did we even go with the, uh, the approach that we will be discussing. Um, and uh, Sanchez will be talking about the various design choices uh, in that direction. And then uh, the most important thing will be, uh, IPO will be the, the challenges uh, that we faced along the way and uh, how we solve them. Cool. Uh, and by the way, like uh, we would like to keep this session uh, interactive. We will. We are planning to reserve like ten minutes uh, for Q and A at the end of the session. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask or, or leave it in the, on the chat. Uh, one of us will answer that uh, as soon as we can. All right. To get started, uh, I think um, uh, one of the most uh, uh, interesting things uh, on this talk is definitely like the scale at which we operate, right? Um, and uh, at Pinterest, we have over 700 petabytes uh, of data, uh, which is all in AWS S3. Um, we roughly run around 150,000, uh, actually more than 150,000 uh, data compute jobs uh, every day. And this is not including the metadata operations. Um, we have over uh, somewhere around like 20,000 Hadoop nodes. We have over 1,000 uh, cluster workers. Uh, we have over 300,000 Hive tables, um, and all of our infra is on AWS. As such, we use the um, the EC2 instances from AWS. We don't we don't necessarily use any services from AWS for them. And because uh, the stock is mostly about the querying experience, it, uh, the obvious question uh, there is like, what are the various uh, SQL dialects or different query engines that we support at Pinterest? We primarily do uh, uh, Spark SQL, Presto, uh, Flink SQL is an emerging uh, 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 dialect as well. We used to be primarily a hive shop, uh, but that is changing, uh, and that actually changed, and uh, it's almost deprecated. It's a very minor footprint is uh, still there. It's, it's very hard to get rid of hive. <laughs> uh, especially when you have it uh, there for uh, like eight, nine years but it's almost gone um and we are primarily uh on Spark SQL, uh for majority of our use cases and then presto uh for our, mostly for the interactive use cases as well all right okay so in this slide uh, what i'm trying to show is that um based on whether your uh, query is a scheduled query or uh, or if it is an interactive query we have a completely, uh, not completely, but like we have a very different path of how the query submission works, how the queries are monitored, how the results are retrieved and returned to the user. 
um, and uh, uh, you can see like the, the scheduled uh, query part uh, is, is the upper, uh, is the green uh, uh, color, and then like the uh, interactive querying uh, is, is uh, below. The only thing I wanted to show from this is uh, uh, there is a difference in the, uh, we, we differentiate between the scheduled querying use cases and interactive querying use cases. And one may ask why, uh, which takes us to the next slide. So by nature, scheduled querying and interactive querying needs are very different. Um, scheduled queries are essentially the queries that are like a user um, using like Airflow or Uzi or something or any um, uh, scheduler, they can schedule at a predefined cadence. So what happens, like usually uh, the, the, there's no one actually sitting in front of computer waiting for the results from these queries. Uh, sure, they will be SLOs. Uh, tied to these queries and jobs, and then user want the answers or the queries to be finished within uh, by a certain time. But they, there is a little bit of leeway there. Uh, whereas in interactive queries, people are actually uh, running the queries and waiting for the results before they do their next task. Um, so that's the primary difference between the scheduled and interactive querying. And but that opens up doors for a lot more uh, differences as well. Um, I actually go back, Sanjay. Um, um, because the scheduled queries usually uh, users usually uh, have tested the queries before. Uh, they they are you don't usually see like syntax errors or analysis issues. Uh, whereas this is a common thing uh, to see in interactive queries, and also like uh, the return of investment of tuning. Uh, a query is usually very low, uh, and when it comes to interactive querying, uh, because it's usually just one query that you have to run, uh, and uh, if you have to do tuning, which requires like multiple runs, then that that's mostly an overhead. And um, uh, if and in uh, scheduled querying, the the resource efficiency be, becomes important because the same query is done multiple times throughout uh, the day or month, uh, and uh, whereas interactive querying, uh, what is more important is the dev velocity. Even if it costs a little higher, because uh, human time is usually uh, more expensive than machine time. All right. So that takes us to the next slide, which uh, because in this session we are mostly going to focus on the interactive querying part, right? And especially with this part SQL. So in this slide, what I'm sharing is like this is the high-level architecture uh, for our solution of interactive querying uh, with part SQL. Uh, if you see. Um, we have this uh, client called BigPipe. Be behind us, there they could be like a uh, lot many clients. We have something called QueryBook. There are people using it from uh, uh, from various uh, from Jupyter. Uh, there are a lot of like um, custom clients that they all uh, use uh, something called BigPipe. Sanjay will be talking more about that. And then they uh, what we use is uh, Libby. And uh, Depending on whether your query is a DML query or a DDL query, we choose different paths. Um, and the reason is, um, as you can see here, in case of DML queries, we we start the or we run the Spark SQL driver on a separate uh, container uh, on Yarn cluster itself. Now, getting that container, starting the driver itself, takes a little bit of time. And in case of DML queries, which usually runs for like uh, a high uh, like half an hour or, or, or like even like multiple hours that initial two minutes or three minutes of latency or overhead is probably fine it's, it's relatively very small uh, amount of latency but when you do that uh, for DDL queries uh, which are supposed to run like in a second or two seconds um, then that two minutes latency becomes very very large right so for that reason uh, we use something called local spark SQL driver sessions uh, on Libby uh, this is an uh, uh, improvement that we made, uh, and again, Sanjay will be uh, talking a lot more about it. So, uh, this this is the uh, high level uh, overview of like how we do the interactive querying. But I'm sure this opens up the question that like, what are the other approaches we considered? Why did we uh, go with Libby? So, Sanjay uh, will uh, walk us through that. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, so we had a few different design choices that we considered while architecting the solution. And the first one was to use a Spark Thrift Server. So Spark Thrift Server is similar to Hive Server 2 in the Hive world. 
wherein you can run SQL queries over JDBC and ODBC protocols. So the benefit here is that it allows clients that execute Spark SQL queries over these protocols to seamlessly integrate with the Spark Thrift server. But there is no isolation between queries that are being submitted to the same Thrift server. So having used Hive Server 2 in the past, we knew that this would be a big problem where a bad query could potentially bring down the entire server, resulting in killing or even failures of uh, concurrently running queries. So we decided not to go forward with this approach. Uh, next thing was to run Spark SQL queries as shell command applications on our YARN cluster. So this is possible by building a service that starts the Spark SQL uh, CLI application on our YARN cluster remotely. Uh, but this approach doesn't really work well in an ad hoc environment like uh, ours because there is an upfront cost of waiting for container allocations on the YARN clusters before we can even start a Spark session. So the, some of the issues that this leads to is very poor latency for syntax uh, checking, right? And also retrieving results for queries that succeeded, tracking statement level progress of each query that is submitted within a Spark session, uh, and then fetching exceptions from the driver logs in case there was any query failure. Doing all of that also becomes tricky with this approach. So next, uh, we decided to look into Apache Livy. Now in Livy, there are two modes, batch mode and interactive mode that I'll talk about uh, more. But before, even the, before we even go into that, uh, with Livy, we can easily submit Spark SQL queries to our young cluster and manage the Spark context remotely via simple REST calls. So this is a pretty ideal abstraction over our complex Spark infrastructure and would allow straightforward integration with user-facing clients as well. Now, in batch mode, it's very similar to Spark Submit, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Spark Submit CLI application, wherein all statements of the query are submitted together for execution. But this makes it hard for some of the usability features that we envision for interactive querying, like making different choices on where to run a query based on a single statement within the session, and then supporting functionalities like altering the Spark session with SQL statements and creating reusable uh, user sessions, which I'll talk about in future slides. And so uh, that's why we didn't go with batch sessions either. And unlike batch sessions, in interactive sessions, we can uh, start the session, which would open a Spark context, submit queries to the Spark context as, se as separate uh, requests, and then end the session when done. And in addition to this, Libby also provides multi-tenancy, high availability, and failure isolation between queries, which were uh, top architectural priorities for us. So next, I'll talk about some of the challenges that we faced along the way and how we solved them. So the first thing is that while Livy provided a very reliable solution to uh, submit the queries as a Spark job, we needed users to submit queries from any client remotely using a standard interface that can be used as a drop-in dependency to easily communicate uh, uh, with Livy. Right? So for that, we wrote a generic DB API compliant Python client uh, called BigPy. And BigPy enables a modular way of interacting with Livy across several different systems. So it provides a clear separation of uh, concerns from the client code. And it has the abilities to, uh, or it provides an interface to uh, pull on the status of running queries and then provide yarn tracking links to monitor the applications and then retrieve, re retrieve results from object stores, in our case S3, and then retrieve exceptions from the driver or executor logs in case uh, the query failed. We also plan on open sourcing BigPy in the future as well. So uh, next thing was uh, faster metadata queries. Now Ashish touched upon this a little bit uh, while going over the architecture, but the problem essentially is that resource allocation on our YARN cluster roughly took about two minutes in the worst case before metadata queries could even run, right? And these are very low latency operations like creating a table or showing partitions of a table or uh, describing a table, right? So DDL queries are executed, are, executed over the driver and they don't need additional executors. So, uh, or the same level of isolation uh, as DML queries, which are uh, heavier in nature. So we implemented a local session pool of uh, locally uh, run, running Spark applications in Libby itself to uh, solve this. And so that basically splits this problem in two parts. First is to identify a query as a DDL statement and distinguish it from a DML statement. And so to do this, we first obtain a logical plan for the user query, which is just a, a tree of logical operators, right? Which inherit from the tree node class. And so we traverse this tree, and then we check the class of each node against a set of DDL execution commands via simple pattern matching, as you can see on the other half of this slide. And then if all nodes in the tree 
match with DDL commands, then the query is a DDL statement or a metadata statement, or and otherwise it's a DML statement. So now that we've identified a query as a DDL statement, next thing was to uh, route it to this pool of uh, locally running Spark applications. Now this pool is initialized on server start time and it has a configurable uh, minimum limit and a maximum limit as well. And it's completely self-reliant and some of the features that we uh, implemented here were automatic GC for stale applications and launching new ones. And then a daemon thread that monitors the health of the pool uh, in like a configurable interval and then routes queries to the next available application. And then also asynchronously uh, launching a lightweight metadata operation on start time so that we can initialize the Spark context first and establish a live connection to the meta store so that subsequent user queries can run faster. Next thing was also as a byproduct of waiting for resources to be allocated on YARN uh, was syntax checking becomes extremely slow. And so in cluster mode, that obviously takes a lot of time. But in ad hoc environments, we want the query to fail fast in case there are any issues with it. So the solution to, to do this is to fetch the logical plan again, even before the query is uh, submitted to our YARN cluster and check for parsing exceptions while fetching the logical plan. And uh, how we do this is we just use the Spark SQL parser from the Spark library. And uh, and then the parse ex exception also has the line and column numbers, which we return back to client to highlight the exact part where the query had issues. And uh, this led to an improvement of checking syntax uh, within like less than two seconds on average, um, as compared to like over a minute uh, in simple cluster mode. And next thing was uh, error handling recommendations. So obviously in any ad hoc environment, failures are inevitable, but uh, the way people would obviously fix these failures would uh, would be skim through the driver logs, find a solution via self-diagnosis or seek external help from other engineers and then retry the query. And so to alleviate some of these pains, uh, we provide automatic error handling suggestions. And the way we do it is we first fail the YAN application based on the last query's uh, execution status. So like if any query within a session failed, we would fail the YARN application. And the reason we need to do this is because in interactive sessions, uh, the session would consistently report a success status back to the YARN application master. And this happens because the remote driver program submitted by Livy uh, starts a Spark context, runs some queries within this context, and then shuts down the context. Now, regardless of the status of the queries run within this uh, Spark context, the final status will always be whether the con Spark context was able to close successfully or not, right? So this is misleading to users and for us as platform owners. Um, so to mitigate this issue, we track the status of the final query run within the session and then throw a runtime exception in the driver program if the query fails. And so this populates the YARN diagnostic logs on top of which we added some uh, custom logging to identify the frequent failures that users encountered. And then once that was done, we built an error classifier along with the troubleshooting information for all these common, commonly occurring errors in Dr. Elephant, which we use to track heuristics for different, different Spark applications. And then we integrate Dr. Elephant with Livy via the application ID of the uh, user session. And then we also enable client code, as you can see in this uh, image here, to retrieve troubleshooting information directly from the Dr. Elephant APIs. And uh, next is, so use, we, we noticed something that user applications are often very generous with executor and driver memory allocations. So this obviously causes unnecessary resource wastage on our, on our YARN cluster. And on the other hand, uh, for applications that run out of memory very frequently, users were requesting a faster way to preemptively catch these, catch these issues so that tuning can be uh, faster. And so to solve this issue, we show uh, real-time memory consumption information directly on the clients, and we flag the applications for over and under consumption, as you can see in the, in the GIF here, so that users can take actions on it. And how we do it, we added a custom metric sync in uh, using the Spark metrics library in the Spark code itself, which pushes these, periodically pushes, pushes these metrics to OpenTSDB, uh, which our clients use, so BigPy, in our case, and return the information back to uh, the user-facing clients, uh, like query book. And uh, lastly, we also made a ton of operational improvements on Livy itself. The first one was effective load balancing. So now Livy is a stateful service, 
And our clients use a HTTP polling mechanism, so classic application load balancers are difficult to add on top. So we implemented our own load balancing algorithms on the application level by routing each query to the least busy uh, instance in a round robin fashion. And here, busyness is defined by the number of active sessions running on a particular Livy instance. Right. So this enabled us to uh, distribute the load uh, fairly evenly across the cluster. And uh, next, we added a ton of metrics and logging improvements. Uh, so obviously, like as any service which has a very high load, the logs become extremely convoluted, and debugging user issues becomes a huge pain. So we added event listener support to Livy, where these event listeners would log JSON objects to disk when an event fires. And an event definition here is a session create is created, uh, a new statement is submitted, a new statement just uh, finished in execution, and the results are back, or the failure stack traces back. So when any of this event, any of these events happen, it would lock the JSON object with the context uh, to disk. And so this makes debugging for user issues very easy and faster for us as service owners. And um, we also added a ton of metrics on Livy using uh, Scalatra to uh, count metrics like daily active users, monthly active users, uh, just to uh, effectively monitor the load that Livy is experiencing. And that brings me to the end of our presentation. Thank you so much. And we would also like to thank uh, the community for all the great contributions to uh, Spark and to Libby. And we also plan on open source or uh, contributing our contributions back eventually. And thank you. Now I guess we can open up to any questions. Cool. I think like initially we were thinking uh, we are going to run out of time, so we <laughs> we kind of optimize the slides and our speed to uh, to finish early. Um, but I think yeah, uh, as Sancho said, if you have any questions, either leave it on the chat and we can take it from there, or or just uh, think you can come off mute and then ask the question as well. Sanjay, do you want to uh, leave a note to the blog post in case like someone wants to refer to the? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, if you want to reference any of this information along with stuff that I had to cut out due to time restrictions, uh, feel free to read our blog post on interactive querying with Spark SQL. I've left a link to that in the chat. All right, great. I guess uh, there's no follow-up question. That means we did a great job at explaining things. Good job, Sanjay. <laughs> All right, in that case, uh, we will just end the session early then.